Well, we're moving into the seventh and last chapter of Matthew's account of the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I, did, I said the Lord's Supper, I meant the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Maybe I should catch my breath and start over, but uh, we are in the last chapter, and if there's any doubt about it, look at the opening uh, verse of chapter 8. Uh, where Matthew says, when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds uh, followed him. So this, is, this will be it uh, when we finish chapter 7, and we'll move on to something else. But we're in ch chapter 7, and one might wonder at what seems to be perhaps a abrupt change of topic to start chapter 7, with the Lord moving from the topic of anxiety, and you remember uh, that was uh, the lesson three, four weeks ago, the last time we were together, or at least with me, uh, moving from the topic of anxiety to this sudden, very familiar command, do not judge so that you not be judged. But the Lord has, in a sense, been holding judgment before his disciples for some time. He has implored us to judge uh, carefully how we live, uh, whether as before men or before God. And that will affect uh, how we give to the poor, how we uh, pray, uh, how we fast, how we forgive others. Uh, we're constantly faced with judging what is important to us. Uh, will the treasures that we store up be bound to this earth, or will we store up treasures in heaven? Jesus has called us to be discriminating in what we seek after. And that requires that we consciously live our lives with the awareness that we live them in the very presence of our Heavenly Father. And therefore, the Christian is someone who must be aware that his Father is always watching him, looking upon him, and in a peculiar sense, judging even him. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones even summarized the entire seventh chapter as presenting the Christian as one who lives always under the judgment of of God and in the fear of God. But the seventh chapter begins with a forthright command not to judge. And so let's read the passage. The idea of judging others is the topic of the first six verses. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is, is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? Now that... Behold is a very common biblical word. We see it a lot, and sometimes it's just sort of a connector. But here it has a little more meaning. Uh, it's like Jesus is saying, and look. And we'll say, say something more about this in a minute. But look, the, the log is in your own eye. So how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not cast your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. It's often said of that first verse, do not judge so that you'll not be judged, that it's one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. For it is said it can easily be misconstrued as a disallowing any kind of thoughtful discrimination or criticism of others. I'm not sure that's really true. Most of us know in our hearts, uh, rather intuitively, that Jesus has in mind condescending, censorious judgment of others. We know it because we sadly recognize it in ourselves. Uh, what is that common, common saying? There is a little larceny lurks in us all. Well, it also is certainly true that a lot of judgmentalism 
uh, resides in us as well. So when we read, do not judge so that you will not be judged, I tend to think most of us know what the Lord is saying. This is an important passage for Christian living. Because it is surely true that most Christians are especially susceptible to what our Lord is condemning. We love to look down our nose at others, and we're continually declining any opportunity to really ponder our own conduct and our own shortcomings. I know that's human nature, uh, but it's quite dangerous and leads to all sorts of wayward conduct, unkind relationships, and foolish preoccupations. And so the Lord admonishes us here, uh, be, beware of having an overly negative attitude toward others in the sense of imperious censoriousness. Don't be hasty co to condemn because it promises a similar judgment in return. Uh, not only that, but it, at any one time or another, most of us are so handicapped by our own faults, it can be near impossible to perceive clearly enough what may or may not be amiss in someone else. And the result is we become hypocrites. And which one of us wants to be called a hypocrite? I don't. But now we must be careful. Uh, the Lord is not saying that we must never engage in critical thought. Uh, we know that from the context of the Bible as a whole, but especially of the New Testament. In this very passage we're studying, the Lord will ask us to discriminate between those people we encounter who may be dogs or swine and those who are not. Uh, that requires perception and, dare we say, judgment. John Stott remarked that do not judge does not mean do not think. And two, later in this chapter, in verse 15, the Lord will issue a warning about false prophets who will come into the church in sheep's clothing, but who are inwardly ravenous wolves. Well, that's such an important verse for every local church, including our own, that's ever existed. But we cannot guard against such deceivers unless we're diligent in evaluating what they say and what they do. In a similar way, the Lord, earlier in the sermon, exhorted his disciples to be different from the world around them, and above all, to adopt a righteousness that is superior to the scribes and the Pharisees. How were they to do that without observing their so-called righteousness and, and making distinctions between what is real and, and what is not? The apostles certainly made judgments, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 was prepared to hand over a certain promiscuous man to Satan, uh, demanding that the local church there discipline him. Uh, but that kind of necessary discipline requires judgment. In Galatians 1 verse 8, he pronounced anathema on any who would preach what he deemed a different gospel than the true one. And in Philippians 3, he judged false teachers tormenting the church to be dogs, that's what he called them. In each case, a judgment had to be made to make sense of what Paul was saying. We can't speak of all the examples, there are many more, and you, you may be thinking of some particular ones yourself. Uh, but lest you think, well, they were apostles, they could do that. Uh, the apostle John in 1 John chapter 4 issued the command that all his Christian friends, he called them friends, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. And in the seventh chapter of his gospel, Jesus is quoted as saying, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The fact is there are different kinds of judgment. We know that. That Greek word in verse 1 allows for that. And as we read our Bibles, we pay attention to the context in which it is used. And here, it is blind, censorious judgment, the kind of critical spirit that led Paul in another place, Romans 14, to ask, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. I think it's fair to say, for most of us anyway, that we engage in a lot of, of judging, uh, some more than others, but we must always submit 
our evaluations and criticisms to God's Spirit residing in us and ask Him to reveal to us the source of our judgments. What is the motivation? Are we, in fact, hypercritical? Are we presumptuously self-righteous, like the Pharisees with the publican and like the Pharisee with the publican in, in, in Luke chapter 18, who arrogantly prayed, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And Jesus then uh, gave the memorable contrast of the tax collector himself, standing far away in a corner, perhaps, unwilling even to lift up his eyes to God, but instead beating his breast and wailing, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. This Pharisee was guilty of censorious judgment, but he was in no po position to do so. Uh, likewise, are we even able to discern the reality of faults in others, or must we first turn our attention to ourselves before turning it to others? John Stott had a way with words. He wrote, the command to judge not is not a requirement to be blind, but rather a plea to be generous. Jesus knows, does not tell us to cease to be men or women by suspending our critical powers, which help to distinguish us from animals, but to renounce the presumptuous ambition to be God by setting ourselves up as judges. And I hope you don't grow weary of me quoting from Lloyd-Jones, but as you remember, he wrote an exhaustive commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And, and here, Jones probed uh, deeply into the ways such a spirit of criticism manifests itself. This is, this is how it appears in practice. It puts prejudice in the place of principle. It puts personalities in the place of principles. It habitually expresses opinions without knowledge of all the facts. It never takes the trouble to understand the circumstances, never ready to show mercy. And finally, it manifests a tendency to pronounce final judgment on people as such. That is, it is not a judgment so much on what people do or believe or say or upon the, as upon the persons themselves. So the Lord commands, do not judge, uh, but he doesn't leave it at that. He goes on to give some concrete reasons. The first is that you will not be judged. Now, that can be taken in one of two ways. Um, let's think about this. Do not judge that you not be, not, not be judged. That can be taken one of two ways. He may have been reminding those who enjoy criticizing others that such attitudes will inevitably lead others to judge you. That is a possibility that you'll be hoisted on your own petard. Uh, this is the boomerang effect. What goes around tends to come around uh, back to you. Uh, most people who are criticized, whether fairly or not, tend to respond in kind. Uh, along the same lines, people who are generous in their attitudes toward others often receive grace in return in, instead of the opprobrium of, of others, a measure of gracious indulgence. Uh, but that, if we took it that way, that would be an atypical application coming from the Lord to use the responses of others as the motivation to heed the righteous attitude that he commands. And what has mattered in his sermon so far is God's judgment on our attitudes and behavior. Uh, to be quick to call others to account is to invite God to call us to account. And that was the caution Paul gave in that Romans 14 passage, if you go back and look at it. Why do you judge your brother? Listen, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. It is God who is the ultimate judge of our actions and behaviors. And while we may at times feel the urge to step in and, and take on that responsibility ourselves, 
when we act on that, we usurp the role that belongs to him. And likewise, we also tend to get it all wrong. Now, this will raise a red flag, I hope, in the minds of some, this idea that true believers are somehow subject to God's judgment. Jesus said in John 5, 24, that the one who believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. And the apostle Paul uh, began his majestic uh, Romans chapter 8 by declaring, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All that is true, so uh, we dare not dismiss that, that, that great doctrine. But it's clear from the scriptures that believers are not exempt from the methods our Father in heaven uses to mold us into the men and women he would have us be. They are the methods he uses to discipline us. Uh, don't forget the author of Hebrews appeals in, in Hebrews chapter 12. The exhortation addressed to you as God's children. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Our Heavenly Father is the perfect critic, the, less, the error less judge of the way we live our lives. And he exercises that judgment in order to sanctify us and make us more like Christ. And examples of that abound in the scriptures, uh, but one of the most prominent ones, most familiar one, ones, is the one we find with Paul with the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, who had been abusing the pra their practice of the observance of the Lord's Supper. Uh, doing it self selfless, selfishly, doing it uh, without thought to its intent and purpose, doing it uh, uh, self selfishly uh, as, as compared with the people in their congregation. And uh, Paul admonishes them. He went on to explain to them what had probably been a source of confusion amongst the church. He told them that it was for that reason that many among them were weak and sick and a number even had died. But if we judged ourselves rightly, he goes on to say, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord. So that is what the Lord was undoubtedly suggesting when he declared, do not judge so that you will not be judged. And it is also the gist of what the Lord goes on to say in the second verse, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Have you ever thought this? <clears throat> I hope people show more mercy to me than I've been showing to them. Here is a law of reciprocity. And the second reason to not censoriously judge others, the way in which you judge others and criticize their behavior and their motives and ignore the possibility that you may not have all the facts, the manner in which you are quick to point out another's weaknesses and, and consequently despise the person in your heart may in a reciprocal fashion be turned against you. Are you merciful or are you rather quick to judge? The Lord has already shown his hand back in the, all the way back in the Beatitudes in, in, in chapter 5. It's verse 7. Blessed are the merciful. They shall receive mercy. He didn't follow that up at that point with the reciprocal truth that is implied. If he had, Jesus might have continued do you want God's justice toward you to be applied in the same proportion as you tend to apply it to some? And again, it's necessary that we stress that this does not mean that we are required to suspend all critical evaluation of the beliefs and conduct of, of others. The same holy God who warns us against this type of of harsh and unfair criticism also has revealed that he has holy standards and we are all prone to violate them. We have all sinned 
And as we shall see in the next few verses, the ultimate end is not that sin be overlooked, the speck that is in the brother's eye. The ultimate aim is not that that sin be overlooked, but that ultimately it be removed. But the lesson of the verse, verse 2, is this. Do we really want the standard of God's justice toward us to be applied in the same measure as we tend to apply it to others? I think, rather, I, we, prefer mercy. And now in verses 3 through 5, uh, the Lord, as he often did, reinforces his lesson with an illustration. It's one we're all familiar with, and also one, uh, the more you ponder it, the funnier it becomes. I labeled it in your outline, uh, the moat and the beam. Uh, that's because Alan is here. It's the classic translation of the King James Version, but a moat really doesn't mean much today, except insofar as we know that translation. Uh, but the word really means to any tiny object that has become dislodged from a larger object. So it is variously translated as a speck or as a splinter that has somehow infiltrated the eye of a man's brother. <clears throat> and it is contrasted with a log or a beam that Jesus observes is in the man's own eye. And the Lord wants to know something rather simple. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that is in your own eye? In our neighborhood where Cindy and I live, there are a number of homes, as in many older neighborhoods, where it's common to see the homes being partially demolished and remodeled and space added. And that often requires bridging the old with the new, and so there needs to be added uh, structural uh, components. And so the builders will bring in these giant beams of, of compressed wood to bridge the old with the new and provide stability. Uh, they have a name for these gigantic pieces. I can't remember what they are. Some of you do know. But when they're installed, they're so big and heavy, they need a crane or, or four or five men in order to lift it into place. And it helps me when I read the Lord's illustration to picture it in this way. A speck of sawdust has drifted into the eye of a person at the site, this work site. And over time, it's going to be problematic for, for that poor man. But in this other fellow, one of these giant beams <laughs> has slipped and tragically and in a, a comically ludicrous way jammed itself into his, his eye or smashed his, his head. Which unfortunate situation needs the most attention? In Jesus' illustration, in the opinion of the man with the beam in his eye, it's the other, uh, the man with the splinter who is in dire need of repair. Uh, this is the point of the story, this misguided fixation on others and now quoting from one of the commentators, the fatal tendency to exaggerate the faults of others and minimize the gravity of our own. And one has taken it upon himself to remedy the situation with the other, but he's in no position to make that judgment he is disqualified from the bench. Not only is he disqualified, he is unable to come to his aid. That's because sin blinds us. And that's the Lord's point in the fourth verse. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye. It's a problem of vision or sight or what one is looking at. A.T. Robertson, the Greek scholar whose famous uh, word pictures of the New Testament have been a source of, a great source of understanding to many, and several of you have that, those volumes. 
he took note of the different Greek words that Jesus used in these verses to represent the act of seeing. This is very interesting. The first is blepo in verse 3, translated look. It's the most basic idea of catching sight of something. There's a chandelier up there. I see it. That's blepo. But the next is the word translated notice. In my version, you do not notice the log <clears throat> that is in your own eye. That's a more intense form of looking in, in which one observes something carefully and, and takes time to consider it, to, to, to try to understand it. The Lord wants to know why after catching sight of this speck in a brother's eye, he doesn't stop and take careful examination of the bigger problem that is in his, his own eye. And the third different word is in verse 4, translated, behold, I mentioned it in the scripture reading. It, it encourages looking at something as if it is new. Something like, why look here, there, there, there's a log in your eye. And then the final fourth word for looking is in verse 5, the intensive form of the first verb, diablepo, meaning to not just see, but see clearly, to be able to really see. Take care, in other words, of that log in your own eye, and then you'll really be able to view the speck in your brother's eye with wide open eyes yourself. Well, why is that so often a new revelation to us? And the answer is human nature, sinful human nature. We live with this risk to our own perception. There is no shortcoming too small in others that, we, that it doesn't absorb our attention and distract us from what is the more urgent need. The danger for us, for you and me, <clears throat> when we judge others, is that there's a much more significant issue that we're con refusing to confront, and it resides in us. What we find wrong in a brother becomes a very small thing compared to the sin God sees in us. That does not mean necessarily, and this is important too, that we are somehow a worse sinner, that our sin is worse than the sin, the speck in the other brother's eye that's caught our eye. We've, we've noticed it. We're, we're focused on it. Uh, after all, this is the beauty of Christ's uh, illustration. Uh, what may appear as only a speck in another's eye, when it's lodged in your own, it gets bigger, doesn't it? It's, it is transformed into a beam that must first be removed. And only then will one be enabled to see clearly to take the speck out of one's brother's eye. Well, we need to get to verse 6, but I want to make one last application out of this illustration of the moat and the beam. It's the last clause. Will you look there? Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Much could be said about this, but at the very least, it is this. Our own sin our own sin does not alleviate the responsibility of the members of the body of Christ to one another. And that's, the, that's one of the main reasons to take care of our own shortcomings. Jesus is going to go on in chapter 18 to address what one of his disciples is to do when another brother sins. You know this. Uh, here in the Sermon on the Mount, he calls for the priority of self-criticism before turning to his brother. But in chapter 18, he positively directs us to, to go and show the brother his fault in private. And if he listens to you, Jesus says, you've won your brother. And there's more, again, that we could say about this. But as we often emphasize, as members of the body of Christ, we don't conduct ourselves and live ourselves and regard ourselves 
as in silos, as if it's me and it's everyone else and I have nothing to do with them. And it's you and it's all the rest of us and you have nothing to do uh, with us. We're tied to one another. And the responsibilities that we have before the head of our church, uh, when fulfilled, benefit the body as a whole. So the additional lesson here is of self-criticism for the good of others. Well, we come to verse 6. In my Bible, uh, the editors show this verse as a new paragraph, but there's a, a really a logical link with what we have just considered. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. There is this converse danger uh, to that of censorious judging. It's the danger of being undiscriminating. The saints are not to be judges, Spurgeon said, but the saints are not simpletons either. Dogs and swine were two uh, reviled species in Jesus' day. Wild dogs ran free in the countryside and uh, one did not feed them for they were prone to take that as an, as an incentive to attack you for more. And in Jewish circles we know uh, pigs were considered unclean. So the application is metaphorical. Followers Followers of Jesus were not to be hypercritical of their Christian brothers and sisters, but one, when it comes to those outside of the circle of faith, when we're seeking to be the ambassadors for Christ and uh, the witnesses for Him that He has commanded of us, there may come situations when our audience proves unworthy of the good news that we seek to give them. Uh, providentially, a, a friend of mine sent me a cartoon on Friday. He knows I'm a believer in the doctrines of grace, so he thought of me when he saw this common, comic strip in the Dallas Morning News. You may be familiar with this strip. It's called Pearls Before Swine. He sent it to me Friday. Now, this one pictured a mouse next to a pig uh, at a table. So you got cartoons, four panels mouse next to a pig seated, seated at a table. The mouse, the mouse says to the pig, hey pig, what are you doing? The pig sitting in front of a plate full of, we find out, french fries. We've been eating a lot, haven't we? But here we, he's, the pig is sitting in front of a plate of french fries. He says, I'm going to eat this massive mound of fries. I thought you were on a diet. The mouse responds, I am, but now I believe in predestination, which dictates that your life is predetermined before birth. So, says the mouse, so as much as I'd like to not eat this, it's useless because I have no free will. I feel like you're exploiting this, says the mouse, and the pig responds, Predestination knew you'd say that. <laughs> so, pearls be before swine, a, a humorous version of what we have here. But the lesson from the Lord is a command, though we must say in practice it's a perilous one. The easy part of understanding the verse is identifying the pearls. Uh, the pearls are the truths of the gospel. They are the most important thing in the world to us. They are the forgiveness of our sins given to us uh, as a free gift from God on account of the precious blood of the Son of God shed on the cross at Calvary, covering our sins for us. The pearls are those truths held in our possession that we are to offer to others the free offer of the gospel. Well, we celebrate and we give thanks for those pearls every Sunday when we remember our Lord's atoning death on the cross in the Lord's Supper. But Jesus says there is a category of people to whom we ought not offer those holy and precious things. It's perilous. 
because the trick is identifying who those people are, for that is a serious decision to make. And those of us who struggle with pride or with the type of judgmental attitudes Jesus has just addressed will tend to have a shorter trigger than more sensitive and merciful friends. In addition to that, no one of us, at least in our better moments, wants to take the place of the Holy Spirit in determining who has forfeited the right to these pearls. So we must resort to the examples we find in the scriptures where such decisions have been made by those of greater stature than us. Jesus, for example, uh, showed great patience with all sorts of different people and and even indulged the weak, self-centered pilot when he had sought him out to help get him off the hook. But when Herod, who the Gospels tell us was absolutely giddy at the prospect of meeting up with the Lord and began to pepper him with, with questions, Luke states in Luke 23, 9, he answered him nothing. Jesus knew Herod to be unworthy of the holy. Earlier in Matthew 15, 14, Jesus' disciples had warned him that some of the Pharisees were offended at something he had said. He, he, he didn't tell them to run back and try to make amends with the Pharisees. Instead, he said, let them alone. Leave them. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into the pit. Jesus wouldn't give what is holy to the dogs. Paul, too, exercised this kind of discrimination on more than one occasion. In Acts chapter 18, he abandoned his gospel ministry to the Jews in Corinth, who had stubbornly and persistently resisted and rejected what he had told them and persecuted him instead. And he said, you, your blood be on your own heads. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. In another place, Titus 3, verse 10, he advised Titus in regard to this factious man to reject him after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. So Paul refused to cast his pearls before swine. But as I say, this is perilous ground to walk, and it requires much spiritual maturity to make those kinds of spiritually discriminating decisions. There's a reason in our six verses we've studied today, five are encouragements to mercy, only one to difficult decisions like that. But we do possess pearls. They're ours. We rejoice in that today. We have Im had imparted to us holy things, and that is all the more reason to treasure that deposit and, to, and not display, on the one hand, a kind of critical attitude that would bring discredit upon the gospel, or on the other hand, lead to ridicule. We have received great gifts. God has made us to be his stewards. We are stewards of the gospel. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for these words which are full of mercy to all of us in this room because we're all guilty of censorious judgment. I am. And we would all rather that you uh, deal with us in mercy than according to the sinful standards that we often apply. Lord, give us the grace to, for, of self-examination, uh, the, the grace to uh, be able to see uh, where we fall short of the glory of God in our conduct, in our thinking, in our interpersonal relationships. May we, all, may, may, may we do that with one overwhelming uh, objective in mind that we might uh, give glory to you in front of the saved and the unsaved, in front of the church, in front of the world in which we live. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.